All right. So it is my great, great pleasure to introduce Aretha Van Hurt today, our speaker. Um, a lot of you, I know, know who she is already, so I'll give you an introduction of sorts. She is a novelist and nonfiction writer whose award whose award-winning fiction and essays have been pu published and praised nationally and internationally. Her first novel, Judith, received the Seal First Novel Award in 1978. Her second novel, The Tent Peg, appeared in 1981. And her third novel, No Fixed Address, was nominated for the Governor General's Award for Fiction in 1986. Her other fictions are Places Far From Ellesmere, a genre fiction, and Restlessness, a fictional examination of contemporary melancholia set at Calvary's Palliser Hotel. She is also the author of several critical and non-fiction works, including A Frozen Tongue and Invisible Ink, and her irreverent but relevant history of Alberta, Mavericks, an incorrigible history of Alberta, which has, re has received numerous accolades, including the Grant McEwen Author's Award for Alberta Writing, and the book also frames and was the inspiration for the permanent exhibition on Alberta history at the Glenbow Museum. So if you have a chance at all, Please go to the Glenmore Museum downtown and check it out. It's an amazing show. So as you can see, or as you can hear, um, Van Herk has an impressive publication record. But her influence and importance as a creative writing instructor and mentor for many writers in Western Canada and just across Canada, period, cannot be underestimated. She joined the creative writing faculty at the University of Calgary in 1983 when the total number of creating, creative writing instructors was two. Van Herk in her amazing Porsche, and Christopher Wiseman. Since her arrival, the program has grown to five, maybe six instructors, includes an MA and PhD component. She was one of the key figures in helping to institute the PhD in creative writing at the University of Calgary, the only creative writing PhD program in English-speaking Canada. Her devotion to writing is not just as a writer, but also as a passionate and committed teacher and editor. In an interview with George Melnick for Alberta Views, Van Herk once said that, quote, we have responsibilities as writers. I have a responsibility to my colleagues and to my readers and to my culture. I owe something to this community, end quote. As a university professor and professor of English, she has more than given back to her community, teaching and mentoring numerous students and junior writers who have gone on to high profile writing careers writers such as Anita Ralbadani and Jessica Grant. She has also served on the board of New West Press, creating with Rudy Weave the Noon Attack first fiction series that helped launch the careers of many very well-known Canadian writers today, including Thomas Wharton and Hiromi Goto, who also coincidentally were her students. As further evidence of her giving to the community of writing, she serves on the board of directors for The Walrus, the Friends of Canadian Broadcasting, Alberta Global Forum, Moving Worlds, and on the Sheldon Schumier Foundation for Ethics and Leadership. Please join me in welcoming Aretha Van Hurt to the podium. I have no idea why I'm here, or better yet, I have no idea why you are all here <laughs> at this hour. We should all be at home behind our keyboards. Thank you very much, Suzette, for that generous introduction. And I want to say that although my name is on the organizing committee, my colleagues are the ones who did all the work. Um, I was on leave when the conference began, and they have been the ones who really um, contributed and put everything together. So thank you so much to them. This is a fabulous department, and it is an amazing team of writers who work here. Um, this is not a lecture this morning, but it is a series of digressions, which I'm going to confess to you is the way that I teach. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I have found that digressions are the most fruitful way to work with imaginative students in steering them into, at one moment, uh, the history of what happened in 1905 when Haltain was overruled by 
um, Laurier and Alberta and Saskatchewan, which should have been one large province called Buffalo, were divided in half because the East would have been too damn scared of what would have happened then. Can you imagine? Alberta would have been nicer and Saskatchewan would have been richer earlier. <laughs> It's a great pity when we let politicians influence us. Sorry, that was a digression. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I have always found that digressions of every sort, historical, cultural, performative, are the way that students learn best. The creative writing classroom is an opportunity for that in a way that more uh, rigid and stringent curricula are not. And perhaps that is one reason why we are all so interested in it and why we have found that such a fruitful place to work. My title today is Why Should We Forgive Our Enemies? The Passions and Persuasions of Creative Writing. In the poem Applause, in Robert Croach's brilliant new poetry collection, Too Bad, Too Bad, there are so many ways you can say that, the persona speaks in one poem, or in that poem, as a poet giving public readings from his work. Nervous, a sad Phoenician indeed, in an effort to shepherd or jumpstart his audiences, he hires a guy to lead the applause. <laughs> you already know how dangerous that is. <laughs> the man he hires is a sensitive person who has written a few poems himself. That is what recommends him to the persona, who wants to believe himself and his work worthy of appreciation, if not accolades. But to this poet's dismay, the applause man has an inverse effect on audiences. I read of my pain, of my <coughs> sorrows, of my failed love affairs, my bad investments, my bladder problems. He led the crowd in gales of laughter. <laughs> On the other hand, when the poet reads about the joys of his life, my various happy marriages, my arts grants, my reading tour of the USSR, half the room burst into tears. To add insult to abrasion, when the clapper usurps the stage and reads his own poems, <laughs> which are about truth and justice, the big subjects, of course, listeners feign approval. The fame is the persona's gloss. The bewildered and comic poet, usurped and outraged at his clapper's retrayal, calls him various names, a snake in the grass, a swine's curly tail, a donkey's dong, an ass's rectum, and concludes with the plaintive, but indeed appropriate query, why should we forgive our enemies? <laughs> of course, the rhetorical question remains unanswered and hangs in the air over this outrageously eloquent collection, which is a meditation on time, but also a meditation on writing even while it refuses to succumb to nostalgia. And while on the surface, applause, the poem, is a playful expose of the difference between meaningful and personal work, the poem poses some questions for the entire of creative writing, that still fraught precinct of praxis and theory that we are concerned with this weekend. There has been much, and you will forgive me for indulging in this digression, sometimes thermal and sometimes glacial discussion about creative writing. Its class, its color, its shape, its efficacy, its dangers, its sweetness, and its roles. It seems to be one of the most examined fields in any <coughs> post-secondary institution. We have all, I am sure, enjoyed spirited arguments with persons who insist that writers are forged by a concentrated period of time during which they freeze their asses off in a garret, subsist on bread and water, and scratch at the bites of bedbugs, that now ubiquitously returning um, 
scourge while simultaneously scratching away on large pieces of butcher paper, tortured sentences that are ultimately revealed to be the work of a genius. This lovely fantasy appears to be heavily inflected by Rodolfo, who resides in a garret from La Boheme, some powerful residue of the salubriousness of ink stain, wretchedness, and not least, a subterranean belief in how suffering brings enlightenment. It's a popular concept that has begun to be a subject for Facebook philosophers, who probably have on their shelves a volume or two along the lines of enlightenment for dummies. <laughs> but such indulgent fantasies aside, how do we, as proponents of creative writing, both its practice and its the theory and its pedagogy, <coughs> how do we negotiate the persuasions and passions, not to mention the perils, of this arc. I do not want here to rehash the myriad internecine discussions about creative writing as a neo-academic scam, and I have heard uh, all of these phrases have come up at some point, <laughs> as institutional complicity, as imaginative contamination, as a carpenter's trade, as illocutionary ambidextrousness, not just the content, but how the content is developed. Nor do I have a desire to sieve authenticity and its discontents, or the technologies of creativity. Nor am I intent on revisiting that dichotomous write what you know versus find your voice battles. It seems they have erupted again. And I refuse to engage with the continuous squabble over the abundance of competent books enabled by creative writing courses versus the paucity of brilliant books to be found on shelves or ebooks today. Those are agnostic battles, and while entertaining, inevitably <coughs> arrive at a cul de sac where all the drivers, drivers circle and circle without ever finding an exit. Let me say as an aside and another digression that even competence can become sinister. I once served on a jury with Leon Rook, that masterful writer and thespian, and the jury came to know when Leon pronounced the word competent, it was a work that was as good as doomed. <laughs> I want to circle back to my own experience. <clears throat> I encountered creative writing as a student at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, where um, Greg, of course, taught, although he did not teach me creative writing, although he taught me many other things. Um, and for those of you who tend to mix Calgary and Edmonton up, <laughs> I want to emphasize that the University of Alberta is in Edmonton, where the first creative writing classes in Canada were taught by a Shakespearean scholar named F.M. Salter, who started them at that institution in 1939. Yes, 1939 at the University of Alberta, with the possibility of a creative MA in English available there by 1949. Is Rosemary here? Hi. <laughs> You've heard this story already because you were there. When I was asked to evaluate the University of Toronto's new MA in creative writing about six years ago, I admit that I fell off my chair laughing when someone from that English department suggested sotto voce and almost titillated by perilousness, and this was not Rosemary Sullivan, but one of her colleagues, that this program was a shockingly new and unusual venture. <laughs> I had to, I did indeed laugh, and I admit that I took great delight in informing that person that, in fact, the U of T was merely 60 years behind the University of Alberta, and they ought not to be worried about the radical new direction being undertaken by the advocates of the program. My writing instructors, of course, Rosemary has had to deal with them all along. I think she silenced them well. <laughs> My writing instructors at the University of Alberta, much later than the 40s, of course, provided each a different mixture of provocation, 
motivation, and intimidation. I learned from them, yes, and I am grateful for their tutelage, but I learned a great deal about what I would not do, which is probably the most valuable lesson we can find in a classroom. And I learned most from the actual time that I could, in good conscience, allocate to the work of those classes. By earning a place with my portfolio of doubtless, barely competent, and certainly jejun, but mildly promising work, by paying tuition, and by making those courses part of my serious program of study, I was given the dispensation of time. One of my credits insisted that I must write. Ergo, I must take this work seriously. Not only did I have permission, indeed I was required, admonished, and assigned to write, but that permission extended to reading widely and wildly, just as uh, Craig was talking to us about last night. And most important, to pouring over language word by word in a myopic and proximal haze that I have never quite had the leisure to enjoy in the same way since. What intoxicating lexiconitis. What savage frustration. What improbable pleasure. What jealous hoarding of ineluctable phrases and images. And what squandered opulence we enjoyed. <coughs> it was, in the late 70s, the age of yearning plump with an inexhaustible optimism that only that time, hard on the heels of the idealistic 60s, could muster. I am sad to say that I fear, with Greg, that we have learned since then a wily cynicism, adapted inspiration to feasibility, and begun to count our eggs, if not our chickens, over and over, penciling on them a consume by date and worrying over their edibility. Some unselfconscious buoyancy has been mislaid, if not forfeited. And perhaps in this talk, I am groping my way toward that moment when writing became something other than writing. Greg yesterday identified it as a post-9-11 phenomenon, uh, but I think the malaise set in, or was at least lurking before 9-11, and that just serves as a kind of um, convenient, identifiable occasion for how the world of writing and reading has changed. And yet, I'm also groping my way toward the other side of that obstacle, toward the crack where a shaft of light does shine through. Yes, that's how the light gets in. And yes, it is always tempting to quote Leonard Cohen, <laughs> have them or not. Memory plays tricks on memory. There was, in fact, no golden age of Canadian writing, although there was a time when grants were more plentiful and readings better attended than they are now. Perhaps that was also a time when books were revered more. Perhaps it was even a time when they were read more, or at least read differently, without the distractions of technology. But it was also a time when our population was smaller, and there were fewer Canadian writers than there are now. And fewer books, too. This year, according to the reliable site of the Canada Council for the Art, that body that we all are, um, I know, both grateful for and determined to defend, that site which lists in the interests of transparency all the books submitted for the Governor General's Literary Awards they're only stricture that they must be published by reputable houses and not vanity presses. Canada produced, and that, this is, nine, is 2010, <coughs> 242 children's books, 199 works of fiction, 171 books of poetry, and 215 works of nonfiction. The smallest category in 2010 is published drama with 25 entries along with 15 works of translation from French to English. The number in reverse from English to French is um, large. The number in reverse from English to French is larger. Why, ah, you might ask, but are these books worthy or merely, thank you, Leon Rook, competent? <laughs> or are they, any vague hope, 
brilliant. And with all these products out there, what distinguishes one from the next? And thus, what distinguishes our goal as writers from the next? Their achievement or the amount of attention they managed to attract? And again, Greg was talking about this yesterday, but I wrote this last week. <laughs> and is that attention directly proportional to the extent to which their authors will betray their mothers, appropriate themselves, and promote watches and perfume for ad men? <laughs> ad men, of course, are our new heroes, as Mad Men will tell you. Somehow, in the journey down the road of cultural maturity, writing has entered into a dalliance with the market, that emporium of temptation, that peddler's sack, that double-dealing stock exchange of Bear and Bull and their constellations, where we expect that gambling will make us rich. Well, it won't, but then neither will writing. And that affair with the market, I would argue, is in direct opposition to our domestic relationship with writing. <coughs> I use the word domestic deliberately as antithesis to a 20th century valorization of writing as a piratical and heroic excursion, dauntless, <coughs> adventuresome, and indubitably priapic. <laughs> Sorry, I blame Hemingway for this. The focus on market is a masculine fetish, and the turn of our attention toward the market, an outcome of writing being hijacked by a profit and loss spreadsheet, which is then hijacked again by the many venues that seek to influence said spreadsheet. Pache, Oprah's Book Club, and other such market mavens. The intricate labyrinth of cultural affect reflects the world that we have constructed. As writers, we need to recognize our complicity with that construction, even as we might struggle against its limitations. Just as an aside, by the way, the writer that Oprah took up before James Fry's A Million Little Pieces, you remember that, it was the is it true or not true and how dare you lie in a memoir story, was William Faulkner, The Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying and Light in August. Now, one could argue that the fact that they were three of them clumped into one of those sessions meant that nobody read them very well, or perhaps read them at all, but um, that too is one of those disguises that happened. I would say that would test the mettle of any readership. Jonathan Franzen, of course, came to rue his comment that he wasn't over the moon about Oprah because he had some hope of actually reaching a male audience. Very interesting. With his 2001 book, The Corrections. At least he came to rue it enough to happily settle for an audience with the queen of all book clubs this September when his freedom was featured. But this is a digression upon a digression, which I am so fond of. When I was in the process of recounting my own engagement with the passions and persuasions of creative writing. In truth, although I benefited enormously from having the open space to read and to experience literary abundance with the ferocious indolence of the committed fetishist, and I refer here to the delightful conceit of indolence as inspiration composed by Jean Cocteau, my experience with creative writing came about more accidentally than deliberately. And I want to make a plea to all of us as writers and as teachers of writing to always go, if at all possible, for the accident. Here is the truth. I wanted to make my living reading books. I had no illusion about being able to write very well or about being able to make a living, but I wanted to read without having to think about eating or sleeping or putting air in my bike tires or buying lettuce. I wanted to read in the same way that I breathe. <clears throat> in the same way that I breathe effortlessly, endlessly, instinctually, awake and asleep, gathering in a storm of words and piling them high in my arms. <coughs> when I had read myself into a state of drunken saturation, I would, I knew, be able to join readership by writing. This, I still believe, 
is the best ambition of the writer, the true aspiration, far more than the desire to publish, to attract readers, to be famous, or to conquer any market. We are telling ourselves a story, or a poem, or a narrative, inscribing our desire for what those words can do, because we have to be readers first. Another digression. Reading is, in terms of its widespread practice through mass literacy, a very recent, what should we call it, practice, activity, custom. <coughs> While the history of privileged education goes far back, 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 public education and general literacy, meaning reading and writing well, with sophistication, is very recent not general until the mid-19th century made paper and books finally available to a broader segment of the population than the rich and leisured. Gutenberg might have invented the printing press in the 15th century, but reading was still far out of the reach of ordinary folk until public education enabled literacy and the Industrial Revolution enabled possession of the instruments of reading books. The math would then argue, although I've always been terrible at math, another reason probably why I'm a writer, that reading has only been commonplace for about a century and a half. And its complicity with power makes even that history fraught. For, of course, the ability to read and write was one of the criteria used to demand whether one had the right to vote, and there were even bills passed that forbade owners to teach their slaves to read and write because it would empower them. No wonder then that reading is still such an unstable sight, such a contingent activity, such a mysterious transfiguration. One person's thoughts translated to another person's thinking and individual comprehension. That uneasy or exig <clears throat> sorry, that uneasy or exiguous, exiguous literacy here in Canada, and this is terrifying, this is far more terrifying than that we write books and no one reads them, is as high as 40%. 40% of Canadians are not sophisticated readers. Although, of course, all statistics are malleable. Surely, partly explain the matter of books and reading being so susceptible to the erasures of American cross mass culture. Now, I am loath to proclaim reading and writing as elitist activity, but I suspect that we will witness before long a replication of the medieval age when only monks had access to manuscripts, not because this is forbidden, but because we may be the only ones who care to have access to manuscripts and books. We writers send the postulants before there is, by virtue of inaccessibility and the way that it promotes desire, a renewed eagerness by the general public to gulp novels and poetry that are forbidden to them or not accessible to them in everyday life. The creative writer then faces a world where everyone thinks she or he can read where many skim blogs, websites, advertisements disguised as superficial articles, Facebook posts, and let's not mention the tweets, but where few have experienced the complete immersion, and of course I am resorting to religious language, that a writerly reading demands. Accompanying the current superficiality of reading is of course the notion that everyone is a writer. And if only the right person happens to read one's narcissistic blog or clever digital disclosure, agents and journalists will be banging down the doors to market the same. There comes the market again. Julie Powell is not Julia Child. She is an emulation. Occasionally, the mirror moment is interesting, but it can sputter to an ignominious end quickly. Or perhaps, in my case, that is wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we prescribe to our students a regimen of various constraints to make them work and think, to make them st 
stretch themselves past the zone of comfort that is undisciplined and derivative spewing, this temptation to resist reading is the real constraint that creative writing for both students and teachers and writers faces. Robert Croach again, from a poem in the same volume called I Try to Steal My Own Identity. <laughs> He gets a young computer hacker to come and show him how. We like telling stories to the young, but the young don't like to listen. It's their refusing to hear that gives new syllables to their tongues. Now, I don't want to dis or designate the young. I don't want to dismiss them. <coughs> but the question of the new syllables that are presented there is, I think, what is key to the possibility. Their new syllables may be very different from our old syllables. Their immersions may be very different from ours. But they have to find and discover a way of immersing themselves that belongs to them. <laughs> and I was chronicling how I came to creative writing. I wrote, I lived, and I imagined both, creativity and writing. I still wanted to make my living reading books. I felt and watched and muddled and messed around and got lost. I taught writing and composition at UBC and found it fizzily exciting, deconstructive, like a puzzle that could replicate scenery. No one wanted to teach writing and composition. It was a great place to learn how to teach writing. I found out that I had an aptitude for the loneliness of the myopic marker. I found the work relaxing. <laughs> My students may think that that's why their uh, stories are still covered with red ink, as one of them informed me, it looks like it's been covered with blood. <laughs> I know, it's really not good for me. We're not supposed to use red ink anymore. <laughs> I want to get their attention. <laughs> I taught creative writing at Quantlin College in Surrey and despaired over the basic premise of the workshop method that suggested that students should read one another's work. I was forbidden to photocopy so much. My class had used up all the paper that Quantlin had. <laughs> that was actually true. I got called into somebody's office and told I was I had used up all the paper. <laughs> I have had fraught relationships with photocopiers ever since, and we won't even mention the trees that have died. I read, and I read, and I read, gulping books like swallows of draft beer. And when I was offered a job teaching creative writing here at the University of Calgary, I didn't know whether to take it or not. Would I have enough time to read, I asked in my interview. <laughs> and the committee politely skirted the question without ever answering it. <laughs> this was an English department that included creative writing as an act of readerly faith. Although I was interested in moving back to Alberta, as recalcitrantly energetic as its history and its future continues to demonstrate, to some extent, though, I took the job for political reasons. In the mid-80s, despite the many and talented women writers working in Canada, well-prepared, experienced, frequently performing sessional duties, replacement classes, and all manner of fill-in jobs, there was only one woman in a tenure-track creative writing job at UBC, Sue Ann Alderson, who taught, you guessed it, children's literature. Although, of course, across the country, there were more than 30 men. So I confess, I had a political motivation. And there is more background to this story as well, less to do with perspectival mobility than, again, with accident. The accident that brought me to the back seat of this car called Creative Writing was my predecessor. He was gone before I arrived, so I have access only to the stories about him, which were legion and may indeed have been exaggerated. He hated teaching, especially um, undergraduates 
whom he referred to as boneheads. <laughs> His workshop method was to stop into the classroom, slam the door, declare that everything they had written was appalling, and then sit down and proceed to read aloud from the latest story he had written. <laughs> he did not ask for their feedback. <laughs> At the same time, he resisted reading too much contemporary fiction, stating publicly that he feared his own writing would be influenced. <laughs> and if he really found it too much to lay eyes on his students, he sent his wife in to teach the class. Mm. Only in creative writing, you say. <laughs> well, no longer. This is where I come to creative writing advice, or at least instructor advice. Always follow such a person. <laughs> if you undertake to do your job quietly and conscientiously, you will be accorded gratitude tinged with relief. No time for academic alienation. You can build an effective program quickly and quietly, which is exactly what we did, as Suzette pointed out. You must be as different as possible from the writer you are replacing, young if they are old, female if they are male, agreeable if they are miserable. Fortunately, that's not hard. You must, at all costs, work as a team with the other writers in your program. You will be challenged enough by the various surrounding tensions that seek to amputate this hydra-headed pedagogy and its practitioner students. And then, having carved the quiet corner in carved a quiet corner for writing classes and their regular occasion, what remains is only the cage match of the creative writing instructor versus the writer. I do not again think of this as an oppositional relationship. I once said, and you can tell that Robert Croach is someone from whom I seek advice, even though he never gives it to me, <laughs> to him, Robert, do you think I made a mistake in taking a teaching job, wouldn't it have been better if I wrote full time? And he looked at me with absolute puzzlement and said, most people don't realize, you can't write all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the opposition persists. Will you be a writer who teaches or a teacher who writes? The mashup of the two in uncomfortable space. <coughs> Here is the difference scored by some English versus fine arts programs, their mutual mistrust coded by the milieu they occupy, rather than that they are oppositional. And of course, these myths are exacerbated by the mistrust of the Garrett romancers I referred to earlier. Louis Maynard in The New Yorker in June of 2009 describes our profession this way. And this is such a great quote, I apologize, I'm going to give it to you. Creative writing programs are designed on the theory that students who have never published a poem can teach other students who have never published a poem how to write a publishable poem. <laughs> this is him, not me. The fruit of the theory is the writing workshop, a combination of ritual scarring and 12-on-1 group therapy, where aspiring writers offer their views of the efforts of other aspiring writers. People who take creative writing workshops get course credit and can ultimately receive an academic degree in the subject. But a workshop is not a course in the normal sense a scene of instruction in which some body of knowledge is transmitted by means of a curricular script. I don't know when the last time was that he was in a, any kind of learning institution because you no longer open their heads and pour it in. <laughs> but anyway, that's fine. This is really an art. The workshop, he goes on to say, is a process, an unscripted performance space, a regime for forcing people to do two things that are fundamentally contrary to human nature to actually write stuff, as opposed to planning to write stuff very, very soon, and then to sit there while strangers tear it apart. There is only one person in the room, the instructor, who has usually published a poem. This is still him, okay? But workshop protocol requires the instructor to shepherd the discussion, not to lead it, and in any case, the instructor is either a product of the same process, 
a person with an academic degree in creative writing, or a successful writer who has had no training as a teacher of anything, and who is probably grimly or jovially skeptical of the premise on which the whole enterprise is based, that creative writing is something that can be taught. This is 2009, and we are still looking at that canard. Another writer, Mark McGurl, in his recent book, refers to the workshop in creative writing itself as the universities of place to digest the eccentric, an example of the institutionalization of anti-institutionality. Wow. You may well ask, why should we forgive our enemies? Or you may dodge and sh shrug and dodge the discussion, keeping in mind the twin connectivities of the reader and the writer, the writer and the work, and their particular anthropology. I have learned the hard way not to be sidelined by obsessive discussions about the workshop and which subtle permutation of the workshop is best, not to be sandbagged by a debate about the mentor system and whether it works well or not. As with any circumstance where the perplexing persuasions of creativity are involved, it is essential to be flexible and reflexive, to avoid being what Robert Lowell's students described him as arbitrary, petty, and cruel, we must, I think, be facilitators and not executioners. And yet, and yet, if we have been deeply offended as students or teachers or readers, why should we forgive our enemies? Can we afford to strip passion, pleonasm, or poetry from our practice? Should we settle for some pap about art or life that purports to identify, and I go back to Croce's poem, truth and justice? And so I conclude with advice for writers. Why not? Today it's free. Although I tell my students that my advice is free if they take it, but that they have to pay if they don't. <laughs> it doesn't work, of course. They ask for it, go away. Don't take it, and then they're sorry. <laughs> One. Experience so much as possible and in as many different ways as possible the queer stomach of homesickness. We are too comfortable by far, and we need to know the unhappy shagginess of yearning. Two, embrace indigestion. Eat strange foods that do not agree with you. Taste those vegetables that resemble childhood fears and test spices that will push the boundaries of what you know. Three, learn to keep secrets. They are the writer's greatest ally. <clears throat> Do not confess to indiscretions or childhood hurts. The disclosing person keeps nothing for the page. Curiosity is a dish that must be simmered endlessly. Four, save string and count paper clips. Your department is always bound to have cutbacks. Remember the tone of dial telephones. Hold fast to the rattle of curiosity, that truly human meta behavior that motivates writers curious about curiosity, which leads to mimesis, fantasy, and the self aware and writing imagination. And as for enemies, well, it's up to you whether you want to forgive them or not, but it's always useful to have a few. Remember that. We have time for about we have time for at least five minutes of questions. Craig didn't have to have questions. <laughs> I have questions for him too. <laughs> Let's ask Greg's question. Let's ask Greg our question. That's a good idea. Too late. Too late. No, I actually have a very serious question. <laughs> How different is teaching at Banff from teaching at the U of A? And is that difference significant? Because I do think we make all these kind of arbitrary comparisons. Well, you know, Don Mackay, uh, describes teaching at Banff as the afterlife of teaching. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds a little like retirement. <laughs> um, 
I mean, we do workshops in style, in the program, writing with style, but otherwise it's one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And I personally think that is better if the matchup is true. Yeah, I was going to say, what if you get someone that you couldn't possibly talk to for more than a half a minute? Exactly. So what we do, <laughs> no, what what we, happens? What we do in, in the spring program is you have choices. The poets can work with up to three people, in fact three, and the, the narrative people with two or more if they're able to convince people to look at their stuff. So there's some movement possible, just in case it doesn't work with that first person you're assigned. But I think that's more efficient, and 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 you also get that a more um, yeah it's efficient it's more efficient you get you get that one on one it, it really does become a kind of a mentoring situation at least for a while um, the workshop I think is 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 great I mean going from the lecture situation to the workshop was just terrific for me because it's so much it's so much more efficient than the lecture not nearly the wasted energy that you get in the, in the lecture situation, all those distracted faces. Yeah. And it, you find out very quickly what they know and what they don't know. Yes. Whereas if you're facing a classroom, you can't get that same information. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm not letting you off the hook, so I have a question for you. <laughs> Um, what, do you think, what do you think, uh, <laughs> still, you're not off the hook, what do you think uh, our students think about the workshop when they come to us? I mean, we know what, we have all these arguments as teachers, but what do you think our students coming into a creative fiction, a creative program, fiction, non-fiction poetry, what do you think they think the workshop is going to deliver unto them? Do you want the cynical answer or the positive one? <laughs> Both. The cynical answer is this will recognize my genius. <laughs> and some students really feel that. Of course, we quickly disabuse them of that notion, don't we? I'm, I, some of my students are here. I tell them to take their portfolios and to either put them in the bottom of their canary cage or take them up to the back for you. And I had a student who actually did this after working with me for four years. He took his novel that he had written and rewritten and rewritten. And he knew that part of the process of what he was learning was embedded in that novel, but that it was never going to do what it, he wanted it to do and what it should do. And he shot it. <laughs> <laughs> he put it up against the tree and he took his, whatever it was, his shotgun. What do people here in Alberta have at first? Only in Alberta. Only in Alberta. <laughs> but he shot it. And that was, it was totally registered. He was a very law-abiding man, as a matter of fact. He was the mother to a huge number of uh, Catching an endangered whooping crane. <coughs> he was an amazing, he was a zookeeper. He took it out and he shot it. And he went on from there and began to write brilliantly. Didn't Richard Ford do that to a bad review? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a terrible position. <laughs> I'm sure he's done it to more than a bad review. I'm sure he's done it to a few people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.